I am coming to you from Thessaloniki, Greece, and it is around 10 o'clock on this Wednesday morning. Let's do a video. Let's talk about the news. Let's talk about some statements coming out of Pentagon officials. Let's talk about some statements with regards to Ukraine and Russia and the new strategy coming out of NATO, coming out of uh, Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Let's talk about the Kremlin's response to the shelling in Donetsk. And we'll also do a really, really good clown world. And we'll talk about a little bit about oil supply in Serbia and uh, Gazprom cutting off some, uh, some gas supplies via Nord Stream 1. So let's, oh, and Biden is going to be going to Saudi Arabia in July. We also have that story as well, since we're talking about oil. So let's talk about this statement coming out of a Pentagon official who goes by the name of Colin Cal. He is the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy for the Biden White House, and he was giving a speech, a lecture at some conference, another think tank conference, the Center for the New American Security, CNAS, and this is a Democrat-linked think tank, and Cal actually worked for these guys. So you can see the revolving door. This guy, Cal, worked for this neoliberal warmonger think tank. Then he went over to the Biden White House. After the Biden White House, he'll get a job at uh, the Pentagon. And uh, he'll get a job, sorry, at the military industrial complex. And then he'll, uh, with the new administration, he'll get another job at the Pentagon or something like that. And that's how the revolving door, the DC swamp revolving door works. So this guy, Cal, actually expressed the, uh, in a pretty clear way, expressed the new strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine. And this is about the fourth strategy narrative shift that has come out of the collective West. Cal said, we'll continue to provide Ukraine what they need for the fight. The U.S. goal is to make sure that Ukraine can defend itself, that a sovereign, independent, democratic Ukraine endures that we give Ukraine the capability to strengthen their position at the bargaining table. There it is. That is the strategy. That we give Ukraine the capability to strengthen their position at the bargaining table. To impose a cost on Russia in excess to whatever benefits Vladimir Putin hopes to achieve through this conflict. Our goal was not regime change in Russia. So look, the first goal that the collective West had when the special military operation started was regime change in Russia. That was the first strategy goal. That was what they wanted to do. Shock in all sanctions, try to sink the Russian economy, get regime change in Russia. That was the goal. The narrative was Russia is losing the war. Ukraine is beating them really, really bad. Russia's losing. The ruble's crumbling. The economy is crumbling. There will be regime change in Russia. The Russian Federation will be no more. And, uh, and we need to support Ukraine as it, uh, it comes out victorious in this war. That was the first narrative. The second narrative became prolonged insurgency, and that was defined by Jake Sullivan. So Jake Sullivan came out with a prolonged insurgency strategy when they saw the first narrative was failing. They came out with this Afghanistan style, let's get as many weapons pumped into Ukraine, dump all these weapons into Ukraine, release prisoners, um, being held in Ukrainian prisons, uh, get as many people mobilized. Just Let's just create a prolonged Afghanistan-style insurgency in Ukraine that's going to last 10, 20 years and is going to bleed the Russian economy and the Russian government dry. That was the next narrative uh, shift, the next strategy shift. Then... We had the strategy shift, the narrative shift of let's get weapons into Ukraine so that Ukraine can just hold the line, pause Russia where they are, keep them in place. Russians are not moving. They're not gaining any ground. Let's freeze the conflict. Let's pause the conflict. Let's get as many weapons there to keep the Ukraine military fighting the Russians and fighting them off so that, as Lloyd Austin said, we can inflict damage to Russia. We can give Russia a bloody nose. We can inflict as much damage as possible to the Russian military, make them hurt, make them feel pain, and, uh, and then we'll, uh, 
we'll get to, to the negotiating table or we'll get to some sort of uh, outcome. But the Russians were not going to gain any territory during this narrative shift. The, the statement was that the Russians were going to get rolled back to Donetsk, Lugansk and Crimea. They were not going to hold any territory and the Ukrainians were going to get this we these weapons to hold Russia in place and to get to a negotiation which basically moved everything back to where they were as outlined by, say, the, uh, the Minsk Accords or before the special military operation started. In other words, Lug Lugansk and Donetsk, parts of Lugansk and Donetsk and Crimea. That was the latest narrative shift. Now we have the new narrative shift, which we heard from the Biden White House. We heard from Stoltenberg just the other day, and now we're hearing from this guy, Cal. The narrative shift is, let's get whatever weapons into Ukraine that we can get in there that can inflict serious damage to Russia, to Donetsk, to Donetsk, perhaps embarrass the Putin regime, perhaps so distrust, so doubts in the Russian public, do whatever damage we can to the Russian military so that we so that when we get to the negotiating table, when Alensky can negotiate, he has some leverage over Russia and over Putin. That is the goal. But this latest narrative shift comes with the admission that whatever territory Russia has, they're going to keep. Let's just not let them get Odessa. Let's prevent them from getting Odessa. Cal said that, actually Cal accused, this guy Colin Cal accused Putin of having imperial ambitions and seeking to reclaim territory that he believes belongs, belonged to a, glorious, to a glorious past of the Russian Empire. With Ukrainian troops being stalwart defenders and holding tough, Cal said he did not think the Russians would have the, the capacity to achieve those grandiose objectives. He's saying this because he's, he's referencing the Russian Empire and Putin's plan of, uh, of returning this territory that once belonged to a glorious past. He's saying this because he's talking about Odessa. Their strategy right now, their goal right now is let's shell Donetsk, let's try to get um, guided missiles because Cal announced, this guy Colin Cal during this conference announced that the Pentagon is going to send uh, MLRS High Mars with guided missiles that uh, he says will do serious damage to, uh, to the Russians. It won't change the outcome of the war, but it's going to do serious damage to Putin and to the Russian military, perhaps even Russian territory. But um, all of this is being done so that whatever territory the Russians hold is stopped there. Full stop. Kherson Zaporozhye is lost. It ends there. Let's prevent them from taking Odessa. That's why he's talking about Russia's grandiose uh, past, the Russian Empire. He is referencing, in the statement, he's referencing Odessa. The plan is, the strategy is, we have to at all costs inflict damage on Russia, get to the negotiating table before they take Odessa. There it is. That is what they are hoping for. And that is why this guy, Cal, during the same conference, he said that the U.S. is sending heavy guided missiles with a range of 70 kilometers for use with HIMARS, multiple rocket launchers. Cal said this during this, uh, this conference. He, um, he said that the high mobility artillery rocket system will come with GMLRS guided rockets. Some is a quote. Sometimes when you see images of MLRS firing off, it's like salvos of multiple rockets going off at the same time. That's really not how this system is meant to operate, Cal said. The G MLRS is a precision guided munition and the big one, a 500 pound munition. Think of G MLRS more like the effect of an airstrike rather than launching off whole salvos. So in other words, you can do a lot with a little or you don't need a lot to have a significant effect. This guy, Cal, he lays it all out there. He lays out this, uh, this fourth, say fourth or fifth narrative strategy shift. 
he lays it out there in perfect detail. So now they're going to send these precision guided uh, missiles to Ukraine. What is the goal? Shell Donetsk, create uh, distrust, create doubts in Russian society, create anger in Russian society, and get these guided uh, missiles. Hopefully Ukraine can sneak some of them through to the front lines. Remember, the Russians are going to be targeting these missiles from, uh, from the minute they cross the, the Poland-Ukraine uh, Poland border. They're going to, uh, to track these missiles. They're going to take out whatever they can. But the goal is, let's try to get some of these in place so that we can do damage to Russia, to the Russian military. Perhaps get one of these missiles to even hit Russian territory. Perhaps hit Crimea, embarrass Putin, embarrass the Russian military so that before they make a move on Odessa, we get them to the negotiating table. Inflict a political cost on Putin, inflict a PR uh, cost on Putin so that he says, okay, let's take what we have, let's stop it there, and let's end this. That is their, uh, their strategy, that is their goal. That's the new narrative. So, with that said, we actually have um, a Ukraine official before I get to, uh, to NATO and to what Mark, Mark Rutte said, we actually have one of Zelensky's aides admitting that, uh, that the Ukraine military actually hides out in apartment buildings because they believe that uh, that's how they can better fight the Russians. And this came out of um, Mikhail Podoliak, who's been making a lot of media appearances. He said to the New York Times in an interview that uh, the Russians fight poorly in the cities which is a lie. Everyone knows that the Russians are fighting superbly in the cities. But anyway, his excuse is that the Russians fight poorly in the cities and that uh, in the cities it, it is possible to maneuver and find cover and you minimize losses. You can resist a longer time and inflict significant casualties on the Russians. So Podoliak admits that uh, Ukraine military, they're, they're purposefully using civilians as human shields and hiding out in apartments and using urban uh, warfare to um, to inflict damage on uh, on the Russian military and to uh, to what they believe will will be to to slow the Russian military progress down because they believe that the Russians are not at least his statement the Russians are not good at fighting urban warfare but we know that the Russians are probably the best at this moment in time at uh, fighting urban warfare but um, he's pretty much admitting that, uh, yeah, we are hiding out in cities and we're using those people as human shields. And the New York Times is fine with that. They're like, okay, no, uh, no problem, according to the New York Times. So NATO, we had uh, Mark Rutte come out with statements that uh, NATO and Mark Rutte come out with statements which pretty much fall in line with what this, uh, this under defense uh, secretary said in the United States and what the Biden White House strategy narrative shift is remember the eu nato is always like a week behind the u.s and the eu is always like two or three weeks behind the u.s uh the the the, the talking points the new narratives it always takes them like a couple of weeks to catch up but um nato stoltenberg he's at the hague and he's meeting with uh with Rutte and all these eu officials and he said that ukraine must get more nato heavy weapons and that nato is trying to adapt to the constantly changing demands from Kiev. And he said that, quote, Ukraine should have more heavy weapons and NATO allies and partners have provided heavy weapons and they are also stepping up. So he's kind of echoing what uh, this Under Secretary of uh, Defense said, let's get heavy weapons. Let's try to inflict whatever damage we can on Russia so that we strengthen our negotiating hand and we prevent a move towards Odessa. I believe that that they have Odessa on their mind, even though they may not say Odessa. When they refer to Russian Empire in any statements, when they refer to Russian Empire, take it to the bank. They're talking about Odessa. So Mark Rutte said during this meeting, he said, in terms of weaponry, we stand united here, that it is crucial for Russia to lose the war. And as we cannot have a direct confrontation between NATO troops and Russia, what we need to do is to make sure that Ukraine can fight that war and that it has access to all the necessary weaponry. Once again, Rutte, 
echoing what Stoltenberg said, echoing what the Biden White House is saying. Let's get some weapons that can do some damage so that we can inflict um, not only physical damage to Russia, but PR, um, optics, political capital damage to the Kremlin. That is what they're looking to do. Notice how Rutte said that uh, one of the goals is for Russia to lose the war. He doesn't say for Ukraine to win. He says for Russia to lose. And he also admits that NATO and the EU, they're too chicken you know what to fight the war. So Rutte pretty much comes out and says it. We're going to let the Ukrainians fight the war on our behalf. I mean, he says it. He straight out says it. This is about throwing as many Ukraine uh, citizens, as many Ukraine men, into Donbass so that they can fight the war on our behalf. We're not going to fight it. We're too scared to fight it. We know we can't fight it. We know we can't win. And so Rutte is saying what we have to do then is to make sure that Ukraine can fight that war, that it has access to all the necessary weaponry. We'll give you weapons, Ukraine. We'll give you whatever we can provide, whatever we can give. Just fight the Russians to the last Ukrainian so that we don't have to. That's an outright admission from the, uh, the prime minister of the Netherlands. Fight, fight the Russians to the last Ukrainian. That's, uh, that's the EU plan. I mean, the EU, for its part, the commission, the European commission, you know, if, if you said that that is the, the stick that they're hitting Ukraine over with, over the head with, you can say that they are giving Ukraine some sort of carrot, though it's, it's a carrot that uh, may take 20 years to get to, if they even get to it, and that has to, has to do with uh, getting it to the European Union. Uh, the EU Commission uh, is saying that they are going to support a candidacy from Ukraine. They've come out with a statement saying that, the, uh, saying, saying as much, saying that the Commission does not forget that Ukraine is the only country in Europe where people died where people were shot at because they were on the streets carrying EU flags. Now we cannot tell them, sorry guys, you were waving the wrong flags. So I guess what the commission is referencing to here in this, uh, this quote is they're referencing to, they're referencing the Maidan 2014 with the snipers and, and I guess they're referencing that incident. But uh, the last I, I heard <laughs> from what I understand from Pretty much all the, the documented research, and it's pretty much been confirmed, is that the snipers were put in place in order to push the coup along, not in order to, uh, they weren't there to take out people carrying EU flags. Actually, the opposite. They were there to shoot at people from both sides so that they can, uh, they can create chaos and get the coup um, moving. That's my understanding of the snipers. They, they had nothing to do with, uh, with people carrying EU flags. They were actually there, probably put in place by the collective West in order to, to complete the, the coup d'etat at the Maidan. But anyway, that's what uh, the EU Commission is referencing. And um, they've given the, their support for a Ukraine candidacy. So, you know, the stick is from the collective West is fight, fight, fight to the last Ukrainian. The carrot is in 20 years, Whatever is left of Ukraine, if anything is left of Ukraine, yeah, in 20 years you might get into the EU. And that is if anything is left of the, uh, of the EU at that point. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's the carrot and stick. So Russia has actually had some statements they've condemned. The Kremlin has come out and they have uh, condemned the shelling in Donetsk. And you had um, Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman. He has called it barbaric, saying we're seeing absolutely barbaric shelling of civilian facilities. They're barbaric. In recent days, we've witnessed these shellings intensifying. When asked whether uh, assistance would be provided, Peskov responded by saying it's the prerogative of the Russian defense military as it's related to the special military operation in Ukraine. However, Peskov noted that President Putin had made it clear that the main and principal goal of the special military operation is ensuring the safety and protection of the people in Lugansk and Donetsk. So he said barbaric actually three times in his statement. And he said that uh, whatever we're going to do to stop this shelling is up to 
the Russian military, but one of the main goals is protecting Donetsk and Lugansk. So basically, I read it as the Russians are going to continue on their plan to denazify, demilitarize, and they're going to, they're going to continue to, to move towards this fortified areas, these fortified areas uh, of, of Devka, Marinka, and I believe the other area is Pes, Pesti or Pesky. So, something like that. I, I, I forgot the names. But uh, these fortified areas where the shelling is coming from, the Russians are going to continue to move towards these. They're going to they're going to move from the flanks. They're going to encircle these areas, and then they're going to take them out. I believe that's what's going to happen. Um, and uh, and obviously the Kremlin understands what's going on, and uh, I'm sure they're going to, to to make some moves in order to to I guess le lessen lessen the shelling to a certain degree, but they're not going to tackle these fortified areas. I don't think they're going to get to these areas just yet. I think their first priority is, uh, is Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, and of course, the big priority is Slavyansk, and then they're going to get to these fortified areas. So that is the statement coming out of, uh, of Peskov. And let's uh, shift gears. By the way, there was a Georgian, um, a Georgian military, like a mercenary in Ukraine. And I, thought this, I thought this was inter interesting, and I'll just mention it briefly. But this Georgian uh, military official who's like in charge of, uh, of all the mercenaries in Ukraine fighting this uh, conflict, he said that there's 20,000 foreign fighters currently serving in volunteer units in Ukraine, and 3,000 of them are British nationals. And he said that is the second most represented country. It's above... The United States. So, Russia, so the United States is number three. Britain is number two. But this Georgian um, mercenary who's in charge of these, uh, these foreign fighters, he didn't mention what the number one country is. What is the number one represented country of mercenaries of foreign fighters in Ukraine? Comment section, let me know. I don't know. I haven't heard any reports as to what number one is. According to this Georgian uh, soldier, number... Number two is the UK with 3,000 soldiers. Number three is America. There's 20,000 total. Is number one Poland? Is, uh, my guess would be Poland, but I don't know. I have no idea what number one is, or maybe I'm missing something. Let me know in the comments down below if uh, anyone knows what the number one foreign fighter country is in, uh, in Ukraine. Let's, uh, let's shift gears. So Biden, Biden is going to Saudi Arabia, by the way. I think I mentioned, did I mention that in my open? I think I mentioned that. He's going in July and he's going to beg uh, MBS to, uh, to pump out some oil. <laughs> and the clown world deals with Biden, by the way. So he's, uh, he's going to be going there in July. He's going to make a stop in Israel, then the West Bank, and uh, then he's going to meet with MBS. So Bidenopolis is getting very, very desperate. If uh, the, actually the Biden White House is getting very desperate if they're going to send Bidenopolis all the way to Saudi Arabia in order to beg MBS, who he called a pariah, they're going to beg MBS to get the oil out there. So uh, <laughs> not looking good for the Biden White House. I believe gas prices hit an all time high yesterday. Is that true, everyone in America? Did they hit an all time high? And it's not stopping. It's just going to go higher and higher. And that's a good segue. To, uh, to talk about Serbia and some of the comments made by uh, Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic with regard to oil. He said that his country will stop receiving Russian oil imports soon due to the EU's latest package of, of sanctions. Vucic explained that the Russian fuel is first delivered by tankers to Croatia and is then sent for processing through the Adriatic oil pipeline. Serbia imports almost 70% of the oil it consumes and almost all of it comes through that route. Quote, dozens of new problems appear every day from November 1st. We will not be able to import Russian oil under the current sanctions. And who knows what other restrictions will be adopted by that time Vucic was quoted by Russia's TASS news agency. Things are, uh, are not looking good for Europe. And unfortunately, Serbia, which has kept uh, a neutral line, to this very day, they have kept a neutral line. People say they're pro-Russia. Yeah, they have good relations with Russia, absolutely. And they, they haven't turned their back on Russia by putting sanctions on Russia. And it doesn't look like they will. 
But Serbia has been pretty, pretty neutral on this, but they're caught up. They're surrounded by a bunch of uh, EU hysterical ideologue, Klaus Schwab globalist <laughs> leaders. There's no other way to, uh, to describe it. And, and they're going to have trouble with oil. They're going to have trouble with oil. And I imagine Hungary's going to be in the same position. And a lot of countries are going to be in the same position, regardless of the guarantees that uh, uh, the EU gave to Hungary with regards to oil. They see the writing on the wall. They see that these guys have no reverse gear. And um, no matter how many guarantees the EU gave to Hungary, for example, with regards to oil, I think they, they both understand Serbia and Hungary. And, uh, and all of these countries caught up in this in Ursula von der Leyen's crazy, crazy mission to stick it to Putin, they understand that uh, they better start preparing now before it's too late. So let's uh, let's do a clown world, and we'll uh, we'll wrap this video up. Oh, I wanted to talk about the uh, the Gazprom, Gazprom slashing some of the the gas flowing via Nord Stream. So Russian uh, Russia's Gazprom announced on Tuesday that it was reducing gas deliveries via Nord Stream pipeline after German company Siemens failed to re return gas pumping units to Gazprom's compressor stations on time. Gas supplies to Nord Stream gas pipeline can currently be provided in the amount of up to 100 million cubic meters per day, giving Gazprom's planned daily volume of deliveries at 167 million cubic meters. The flow will be cut by 40%. Siemens has not yet commented on the situation. The company announced back in March that it would halt equipment deliveries to Russia. Last month, however, it said it would completely withdraw from the Russian market and launch procedures to terminate its business activities in the country. So Siemens was supposed to deliver, was supposed to return something like 10 um, pumping units to Gazprom and... Uh, and it didn't do it, and so Gazprom had to, because of technical reasons, they had to cut 40% of the gas being uh, sent via the pipeline. What can Gazprom do if Siemens doesn't, uh, doesn't do what it needs to do with regards to the equipment? So I don't know how this is going to get solved. Uh, maybe Russia is gonna, going to work with a local company, a local provider, or a provider that doesn't have sanctions or isn't pulling out of the market. I have no clue how this is going to get resolved at all, but um, once again, it is just doing damage to the EU. This is not doing damage to, to Russia or Gazprom. All this is going to do is uh, damage the gas supplies coming into the European Union, and this is being done by Siemens, a German company. So I don't know, is, is all of this deli deliberate? Is this just pure stupidity? I guess you could make an argument for, for both <laughs> cases. <laughs> Maybe it is both cases. Maybe this is stupidity and deliberate. Maybe the smart people are doing this deliberately because they want to sink the, the economy of the collective West. They want to cash out, sink the economies, cover up their crimes and destroy the middle class. And this is also part stupid because, well, you have very stupid EU leaders who actually buy into the uh, the let's stick it to Putin, Green New Deal uh, ideology. So maybe it's both. Anyway, let's get to our clown world. And this has to do with Bidenopolis. And uh, Bidenopolis was giving uh, a speech to the AFL-CIO. And uh, he was talking about his plan to tackle inflation. And uh, I'm going to play a video of Biden's speech. And Biden, Bidenopolis said, I don't want to hear any more of these lies about reckless spending. And he was shouting while he was saying this. Um, We're changing people's lives, he said. He loves to say that. We're changing people's lives. Come on, man. Here's the video. I don't want to hear any more of these lies about reckless spending. We're changing people's lives. We're changing people's lives. So that was Joe Bidenopoulos. He was talking about his plan to uh, tackle inflation and to get inflation under control. He actually, during his speech, he blamed uh, inflation on, uh, on people who don't pay their taxes. 
he threw that line out there again. And he said that everyone has to pay their fair share. Come on, man. But uh, <laughs> Biden, Biden has these little fits of anger. Biden doesn't have a plan. That's, uh, that's, that's it. There it is. He has no clue how he's going to deal with inflation. I don't even know if, uh, if he even cares. <laughs> deliberate or stupidity? We go back. Is this deliberate or is this stupidity? I guess that's the theme of this video. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up there, everybody. Check out Alexander's channel. Check out the Duran's channel and go to the Duran.locals.com. I am signing out from Thessaloniki, Greece. Take care.